Hello, and welcome to the Afro Reads podcast with your hosts, Amara and Uguchi. Afro Reads is a book review podcast that was created out of our shared love for reading African fiction books. We talk through its themes and try to tie its key messages to our African heritage, culture, and contemporary issues. We invite you to turn the page and let's begin. Welcome to the sixth episode of Afro Reads podcast. I hope you've been well and you've had a good week so far. I am your host, Amara, and I am joined today by Ugochi, our co-host. And we have a guest <laughs> all the way from Zimbabwe. Her name is Rufaro Mbonelli, and she is just completing a degree in creative writing. Her second degree, so we have a few icebreakers for her that I'm going to pass it on to Ugochi to lead on. Awesome. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I'll... Let's answer the first thing that comes to your mind. Don't think too okay. much about it. Okay. Here we go. What is the current issue in the world that concerns you the most? Racism. For your great great grandchildren, is there any wisdom you'd want to pass on to them? Read the Bible every day. What do you want to be remembered for? Inspiring people. That's what I have. That was hard. It was? Yeah. You, you answered it like a boss. Okay, I have one more. Okay. What did you want to be when you were like 10? I wanted to be a businesswoman. Mm. Why? Because I just felt like that would make me more money. <laughs> At 10, you were already thinking that. Yeah, That's yeah. That's so awesome. And, it, I, and like... I thought that I would be respected as like a businesswoman. But I actually started writing at a very young age. So businesswoman, what did you want to be selling or doing to get your money? So in, I'm probably going to offer services more than like selling products. Yeah, like hosting. I'm really good at hosting. No, but at 10, did you think, oh, I'm oh, really no, good at Oh, no, no, I didn't know. I didn't know what it entailed, but at 10, I knew that I would figure it out. Mm-hmm. I was very confident in myself at a young age. Mm-hmm. Like, I really believed like I could do anything. See, I heard this really cool story. You guys have heard it too about a girl in the US that went around school like doing people's edges for I think one dollar and she was 10. So she had like her tub of gel and her toothbrush Mm -hmm. and she just went around doing her friend's hair at that young age for like a dollar. I just thought that story was cool. Sometimes it's in people. Yeah, it's simply it's actually interesting because that's what that's what like the character is, isn't it? She's got it in her. Yeah. All right, so coming up to current events, a lot of things have happened this week. What stands out the most for you guys? So we'll start with our guest, Rufi. What has been going on this week? What has stood out for you? Well, yesterday I had morning lecture. We talked about, you know, the report, the racism report. Yeah, the race report. Yes, yes. Obviously, I heard about it in the news, like briefly, and I kind of just ignored it because I was like a bunch of nonsense but then I found out yesterday it was people of color that wrote that I was irritated (laughs) they basically said that Britain is like the exemplary country for racism and that there's no systematic racism in this country Hmm. no racism in this country no one of color would agree with that statement ever and they focused a lot on like your ability to be successful and your ability to be successful in a country has nothing to do with racism because you experience racism at the top level, wherever you're at, whether you're a CEO. But these people, like they're close friends of Boris, they know mm-hmm. Boris and it's like one of the guys, the, the lead guy, he's like a token black guy. Face was everywhere. When you see the race report, you see his face to show mm-hmm. that, you know, it's legit. When I saw people's comments on oh my god this race report is racism itself i was like yeah i don't want to comment or i don't want to form opinions because i haven't read the report the report's like 300 and something pages but i read like some excerpts because people were posting it online and it was saying stuff about slavery i've forgotten what it said oh yeah it said, it some, said yeah. that they the perspective of slavery should change oh this is excellent this is this is excellent because it's so true yeah um, perception of racism should change you should that we should look at it as that we survived that and that because we survived that like we're great like, yeah so something you know, like that you can look at it as this negative thing like you cannot tell me that the years of oppression and psychological warfare that you put on us we can I can just click my fingers and say we're survivors that's all there yeah is. and you were saying something about like the British Empire and then 
you should be proud and happy that you've been westernized kind of thing. Oh, there wow. should be no complaint that, yeah, it was an excerpt. I, I don't know the exact words. I'm very, yeah, very I, I, particular I, about like taking things out of con- context. Uh, context. Yeah. yeah, I was like, this is just really sad because they politicized it. I need to read about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> about Ugochi, I'm sure you have a lot to say. Yeah. Really I'm going to write a letter to that guy. <laughs> <laughs> guy and be like listen you're officially not black like you should color your skin like whatever but you're not one of us Ugochi how about you what's been going on this week well I was a big fan of DMX still a big fan and he oh passed my it. god yeah. I was too yeah, yeah. Okay. so it's just just horrible I've been listening to his music <laughs> No, you have to sing one of your favorite songs. We want to hear you sing. What's what's like the song that stood out for you? Oh, shoot, the anthem. Your favorite DMX song. The fighters anthem. Dun, 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 yeah. dun, 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 dun. So I played basketball in high school, and <laughs> that was definitely one of our songs that would come out. Hey, that's sick. Yeah. I think what's sad is that he allegedly died of a drug overdose. And I was just thinking of, because my story this week was um, Nikki Graham. I don't know if you guys ever watched Big Brother. Ugochi, maybe not, yes. but I was a huge fan yes. of Big Brother UK. Me too. Like, me too, me too. I used to go to the audition, I used to go to, not the audition shows, but I used to go to the eviction shows. And no I was way! Like, yeah. <laughs> Good for you, man. Yeah, I'm such a fan. <laughs> But yeah, it's just sad that one of the um, house she ex-housemates died. died of anorexia. Hmm. And I was just I was just kind of blaming COVID in a way. Like people are going through so much stuff. Obviously, you don't know the exact details of what happened. But hmm. for you, I think the thing with COVID is that when especially when you've been struggling with mental health previously COVID takes a lot from you because you're not in control of the situation. You just know everything bad is happening around you. The news doesn't make it easier, like switching on the TV. And I think once you've been battling with mental health issues like bulimia or anorexia, you just feel, you know, this is the one thing I can control. So you even get worse in the habit. There's no one to stop you. There's no distraction. And you, you're just into it, you know. And then maybe like a DMX, you overdose or like mm-hmm. a Nikki. Oh, I love Nikki. You just kind of wither away. Yeah. I love DMX and I honestly did not think he was going to die. Like, I was like, it's DMX. He will pull through. I, mm-hmm. Like, to me, like, he's, like a, he's like a Superman. He's been through so much in his life. I was like, he will pull through. So when he died, yeah. it was really hard for me. For some reason, I had, like, because I'm a big hip-hop fan. So like, when Nipsey Hussle died, like, that really got me. Like, felt I didn't sad. know Nipsey Hops. I didn't know him too. <laughs> Till after he died, I'm so sorry. Right, yeah. That's all right. Um, you had you have to be a proper hip hop head to know to really know him. Yeah, yeah. But like, yeah, that really got me. But with DMX, I don't know why, but I had a lot of peace when he died. So did I, I. Just, yeah, I just felt like he's in heaven. Like, and I just yeah. knew he's in heaven. Yeah. And I know he's with God. I know he's dancing with the angels. I know. I just have that peace where I just know he's good. I don't yeah. know why. He he had a really good spirit. If you like, if you follow. Yeah. Him. Yeah, a very good spirit. If, if you follow who he's collaborated with, their mm-hmm. relationships, mm-hmm. he doesn't necessarily all, always do things for money. No, he'll, no. He'll help these his rapper friends out or his celebrity friends out yeah, for free. Yeah, yeah. Like that's yeah. he had a great spirit, and that's why. Yeah, definitely. But he also had demons that he had mm-hmm. to wrestle with every day. Yeah. So it was two was really, sides. What's really sad about him is that he was set up. So how he started smoking crack. Mm-hmm. Like they were smoking um weed. Mm-hmm. Someone laced it with yeah. crack. And he didn't even he didn't even want to smoke. He's like, oh I'm going with it. No, 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 have one, have one, have one. And then boom. Mm-hmm. Like, because that's the stuff you get addicted to, you get addicted to immediately. Yeah. And it's so sad that someone would do that to you. It's the music industry. Yeah. So he's kind of just been alone in life for a long time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the drug mm-hmm. addiction, like I'm not excusing that kind of that behavior, but I I under I can see his struggle. He struggled through life, but he also had this really good 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 spirit yeah 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 that's yeah, personally you know it must have been hard to go through life with those like two combating spirits exactly yeah demons Demon, fighting yeah. them every day anyway <laughs> may so rest in peace and may nikki so rest in peace because yeah i, I love, love her she was such a polarizing character in she was. Um, big brother is she the one that was like who is she who is yeah, she that was- and then her and Pete fell in love. Who is 
she? Her and Pete fell in love on the show. Love, and, love her. Yeah. I've heard about people dying from anorexia, but I've never like known someone. So it's mm. almost kind of like a myth to me. So hearing that was really, it was a lot for me. Because I was like, okay, so people really do die from this. And mm. you just decide not to eat. And then it's, it's a mental health problem. Everyone is watching you with that away. Like I read the news this week and they were like, she was really trying to get to that place. And in my, in my very like, naive mind you know doesn't understand probably i'm like yeah but if she's trying to get shouldn't she just put like a spoon of rice in her mouth but i know it's not Not that simple at all it's just it's just sad i i saw her pictures like her last pictures literally it was a skeleton and then just slapped with skin Mm. So back to the book. Um, funny enough, we're talking about anorexia and trying to be in control in all these like with all these like different alternative ways. And our, one of our characters um, also had bulimia. So we'll be getting into that. So our book for this week that we're going to review is Nervous Conditions by Titi Nagarengwa. So the book basically is about Tambu, the main character, who mm. takes us through her life and her struggles as a young child fighting for the right to get basic education and the obstacles that she encountered trying to get that, mainly around like societal values, societal expectations and the role of women. We see the dynamics of and the complexities of relationships between the different members of the household. And it's nice because the book shows you the different aspects of women from the aunties to the mother's role to the senior wife down to the daughter. You know, even things like your position in in a family in terms of your siblings has an effect of the role you're expected to play in the society. All ended well for Tambu. She did receive her education. So we're kind of happy about that. It's a really easy read. It doesn't take that long. It's about 200 pages. But it's very detailed in the way it talks about these um, complex relationships. So, Mm. yes, I I recommend, based on our last book, (laughs) it is a much easier read. You should definitely check it out. So um, I'm going to go through the themes at the moment. I said there were so many to get through. Like, I was just taking notes on my phone till I got tired and then when we got in touch with Rufi she just added more um, light to what we had to talk about so I'm just going to go through like five rough themes and I'm going to mention them out and then Rufi and Ugochi feel free to chip in so the role of family members is the first one as I said in the book everyone had a role to play and it was quite significant from Namo the brother to Tambu to Baba Makuru, to the different women. So which role stood out to you? I will start with our guest, Rufaro. Um, I mean, for me, it was just tip- like, it was a typical Zimbabwean structure. So okay. um, basically the older you are, the more responsibility that you had in the family mm-hmm. and the more that's expected of you. So Baba Makuru is like the oldest, he's the first son. So he's a lot of responsibility and obviously people look to him and he takes that role on with pride. You know, he's, he's very proud of that and he does really care about the family. What stood out to me about him is that he, he was always thinking of how to improve his family's life. Like he wasn't, some people like come up in their family and they're satisfied with like being the person everyone leans on, but he was trying to empower his own family. And I really like that. Like I like this um, line in this Jay-Z song when he says, here we say you're broke if everyone else is broke around you except for you mm-hmm. and I love that because it's like you should empower the people around you to also garner and to attain their own independence and it really restores dignity in people because when you're um, asking people for things if someone has to keep asking you like their dignity is kind of being chipped away at because they feel they need someone else to survive so I really like that about him so he stood that to me and um, obviously the women stood out to me, mm-hmm. um, like the main character, she stood out to me and Nyasha, her cousin. Yeah, they were just very strong women. And I love how it's almost like they were born that way. They yeah. With, yeah. That, with that gut, with that like. No, we'll know. talk about that in a bit. Ugochi, what, do you, what, what role stood out to you in terms of the complexities in the family and their uh, relationship? I have to echo Rufi and say Baba Mukuru also. <laughs> It stood out for me because, yes, he did a great job trying to empower his family. But at the same time, I can see the toll it played on him and his own family. 
So I guess I can relate or a lot of us can relate because some, some of us abroad, okay, I'll use myself for an example. My dad only had one other sibling in the US and, and then it was mm-hmm. him and then the rest of his siblings were in Nigeria. So people, he, he gave a lot of money, great. And he, he helped a lot of people, great. But then as kids, when we start to catch on to that and we want for something like, hey, can I attend this basketball camp during the summertime? It's a, a no. And then my, my <laughs> mind would go to, <laughs> you've, you've given money because this person in, in Nigeria wants to do this thing, you know, but what about us? So I can understand Nyasha and the way she looks at her dad and I guess her, her situation and then her family, which is her cousin and then cousins. Yeah. Mom and dad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that, that. Can- yeah. You guys are positive about Baba Mukuru. But that's amazing. So when you hear the phrase, you challenge me, which it says so many times in the book, like what came to your mind or what stood out for you when you said you challenge me? So I don't like that side of him. That's it. <laughs> I like the giving side and the side that wants to help his family. But then that other side where you're challenging me, the way he looks at women, I feel like he maybe had a bad relationship with his own mom. I don't know. I didn't see him. I didn't see any positive things he had to say about women or his or, or positive relationships with women. I think, yeah, I, I was going to say that maybe it was just that's how the society expected him to be. And he didn't know any better. It's just like, when people lived in the 17th century and to them a black person was just a slave like you need to have been a genius or be outstanding for you to realize that no everybody's equal but at the same time he had been abroad you know he'd studied abroad so it's a bit unforgiving like you know Mm -hmm. his references he he was he was very paternalistic and it, it was just yeah a bit disappointing like I think that's why Nyasha was had a very complex relationship because I think she kept looking at him, even her mom as well. Like Mm. you have all these degrees, you should know better in that sense. But maybe it's about thinking politically and just being like, even if I schooled abroad or even if I'd I'd lived so long abroad, like I'm now back in Zimbabwe. So Mm. when we're abroad, we live abroad. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? I think that he exuded so much toxicity like from the culture oh I think a lot of things that yeah. in all in all of Africa that a lot of people are trying to change for their kids but he really embodied that and of course like the culture is ingrained in him and by the time he went to England he was much older to study but still I would have expected some understanding because what interests me is that his kids moved back to Zimbabwe and like, he's very strict on them but clearly he wasn't that strict on them in, in England. Mm-hmm. Because he keep saying, oh, you've come back and, you know, you, you've, you, you, you keep taking these things that you've learned over there. But clearly the kids had more freedom there. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to continue their freedom. But he wants them to adjust and just become Zimbabwean again, if you will. But they can't because a, a child has, you've immersed this culture. And I'll use myself as an example. I, you moved here when I was nine years old. To, to mm-hmm. English from Zimbabwe and I could speak English but my English needed work so for example my parents were like okay we're only going to speak English in the house and at school so your English can get better so I was speaking English all the time at home and if I even spoke a Shona word it was like no speak in English to get your English up right and naturally I lost my language oh okay right I lost my language and obviously like now as old I speak Shona more and because I go home more often so it's always it's in your head it doesn't leave you just have to kind of exercise that muscle and your language comes back but then you go home and everyone's like oh you've changed and it's like what well, I had to change right and people are expecting you to be then like no you've lost something but I've lost my language but I haven't lost a sense of who I am mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. um and it's very difficult so that's why like I really relate to Nasha the character because she moved here and then she moved to England and then went back and then she was very judged a lot. And I've been through that. Mm, it, it's hard. I'm, I'm, me as well, obviously, I've moved back and forth, but I've been mm. most of the time in Nigeria. But yeah, I've just never felt that I fitted in. So in Nigeria, I'm always, you know, the one that came from abroad or you don't really understand what's going on or you're seen as a feminist or, you know. And then over here, I'm seen as a Nigerian, my accent, you know, the, the girl from Nigeria. So 
it's very hard in that sense mm -hmm. but at the same time you when you grow up I think you end up being like proud of yourself and just discover like you know everyone is different everyone is a star you kind of live with it I guess <laughs> what do you have for you yeah that's for you guys so yeah in, in our in our culture i'm sure um, i might know someone who was sent back to nigeria from abroad for mm. like discipline yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah do you think that is that harms the child more than it it helps probably because yeah. i mean children are resilient mm -hmm. and you know like i was resilient when i moved here to adapt to the culture here so children are resilient it depends how old they are but it's very damaging like just because yeah. they're going through a lot yeah. Like, you know, you, you see what Yasha went through when she was at the mission and people are calling her white, calling her mm -hmm. weird, peculiar, and your kid's going to go through that. Mm -hmm. I think we need to find better ways of disciplining our kids in African culture. Because, I mean, that happens all the time. But, like, mostly when a child is, is disobeying, they need, to, they need your attention. Not for, you to, not for them to be far from you. Yes. They need you to be present. Yes. I used to say, we'll go back to Nigeria. Nigeria is horrible it's hard there's a lot of bullying in schools in secondary schools like and stuff like here I'm sure it's the same thing but Nigeria there's they have this like tough love thing that happens that you don't realize it till you're grown sorry that tough love mixed with like abandonment issues yes manifests it's, in a bad way for sure I mean that's that's a um a cocktail for trauma mm -hmm. that is for trauma, trauma. And you don't realize it till you're much grown. And, you know, you now have the adults telling you, well, we experienced this as children and we came up fine. And you're like, are you fine, though? <laughs> you're, you're, listen, you're not, you're not fine. Like, I, like, suffer, like, from depression and, like, bipolar. Mm -hmm. And the things that I've learned in therapy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about what affected me as a child, like, oh, my mum yeah. left when I was four. Mm -hmm. like she left Zimbabwe when I was 14 moved to England to provide for me right so yeah. I'm like my mom did that for me she sacrificed for me like I love my mom right mm -hmm. and my therapist is like yes but you're the four-year-old Jew does not understand these things you understand you understand them now but mm -hmm. the four-year-old Jew felt unloved and abandoned so I have like abandonment issues and like to the point where like in my adult life like, if my mom says she's coming to see me mm -hmm. like I would wait by the door if she was taking too long and I would look for her Mm -hmm. oh. get mad anxiety mm -hmm. like unexplainable anxiety and my therapist was like what's happening is you keep reliving her leaving mm -hmm. every time she leaves you you mm -hmm. relive that I'm reliving that trauma so and to think I'm 30 now and I started attacking dealing with these issues like probably when I was like 27 or something like actually going to therapy and you don't know how intricate how intricately those things affect your soul and your spirit and yeah. affect the way you are and how you attach with people, how you form relationships and like what you require from other people. Mm. But then I try to be perfect in all my relationships because my fear is someone will leave me. Mm. Mum leaving made me feel like I wasn't perfect. That's why she left. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to go for one of these therapy things. I want to know what I'll discover about myself. But I, I think I everyone should go to therapy. <laughs> Pardon? I, I think so too. I've been saying it, but I just can't afford it. <laughs> It, it just it blows your mind whole like because I watched Green Leaf. There was an episode of Inyala on the show, and she was talking to the last child um, charity, and she was telling her, "Your mom is basically all your problems." And then they invited the mom, and the mom was like, "Wait, wait, 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 wait. don't bring me into this, oh me! I raised you. I've heard how about I wanted this, to sorry. raise you. Sorry, you watched I've it, right? This, no, I haven't watched it, but this episode, I, I watched it. About. My yeah, sister talking about this episode, yeah. She was like, ah, don't bring me into your problems. And I had a conversation with another friend recently, and she was like, yeah, the problem of these things, because you actually go and end up bringing more trouble if you go back, meet your parents. They were doing the best they could at that point in time. Fine, they were not perfect, but what you should be happy with the therapy session is that you've gotten some kind of reason and you can control yourself yeah. and what you do. Mm -hmm. But to go back and rehash things, it doesn't, it doesn't, I'm not saying it never helps, but it mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily solve the issue, which, which I found very fascinating. Yeah, but it, it, you need, yeah, because some things will never change, right? Whatever happens. It's in the past. never changed. But hopefully you have people in your life that are open to healing and open to have those conversations mm -hmm. because it sometimes it does take some understanding. Okay, <laughs> that was deep. Right, so 
education, this book was all about that struggle to get education. I found it very funny because like trying to hustle to get into school was just never a thing. Like, and I found it interesting that in some parts of the world that hustling to even get past the door and not do household work and get into school and doing up a whole maze farm just to pay your school fees is actually a thing. So when I was reading the book, there was just that gratitude of like, there are just certain things to be grateful about in life that other people don't really have opportunity to have those kind of experiences. And yeah, so I was just asking you guys of like the gratitude you felt reading the book, whether it was about education or money or any other aspects of the character's life that you're just glad you don't have to experience in this day and age. Mm. Mm. It made me feel guilty. Yeah. About what? Because like my mum obviously moved us over here and I had education and I don't mm-hmm. think I appreciated it as much and I always think to myself well, if my cousins came maybe they would have used this opportunity better than me I was afforded so many things that are easy but for them it's like their lifeline it's to yeah. get no people tell you uh, education is freedom I think this is one of the first books I read it and I really felt that education yeah. is freedom like this is what's going to free them because that life they live is a hard life and that's that they're into their books and like in Zimbabwe like Zimbabwe is a very well educated country mm-hmm. like the country is not in a good state but if it if everything changed tomorrow like everyone can get a job everyone has a degree mm-hmm. and you know I think at one point we were like our education system was like the best in the world at one point when Mugabe was president you know because he went to he went to Cambridge University ah. education was really really big for him you know so he made it like for example compulsory to teach in English so like you know so English is easy yeah. for everyone like it just it's really interesting and it's really reflective of what the culture still is today and that education is so important that everyone is doing a degree everyone everyone's educated but the thing is there's no jobs and it's actually quite interesting because some of the debates that we have in our in our in our Zimbabwe community is like all these people are so smart but the thing that's rich in our country is our soil and it's farming but like mm-hmm. everyone's educated to do these jobs, but it's like we should be teaching them to farm because that's what's going to make our country rich. And it's this argument people have because, you know, everyone's sending their kids to like people that can send their kids to Australia, Canada, here to study all this education. But it's like if they just like farm their farms, they would be very wealthy. And it's actually quite an interesting debate because it's true. But then I think the world has like glamorized the other things and everyone's chasing that. Farming the farms is good, but it, it, it would definitely not make you rich. What would make you rich is the services, the value chain, the value add from the farming. So mm-hmm. not necessarily tilling the soil, but like turning cocoa, for instance, into chocolate and making sure that that process stays within your country. Because if everybody farms their farms, the problem with the soil is that Zimbabwe is situated in one place. So, for instance, mm-hmm. farming your farms doesn't necessarily mean you farm rice, cassava, and all the crops mm-hmm. in the world. It means that because it's Zimbabwe, your soil is only going to be useful for one crop. Now, if everybody does the same thing, mm-hmm. the value of, say, cassava or millet, uh, me, I think it was said in the book, is going to be always low. So you're not rich because there's too much supply. So what you want to make sure is that once you have the milli me, you can turn that into processed foods and you have the services and everything. Mm -hmm. And then you can export it. It, it, It's complicated, but we can definitely do that though. Yeah. I mean, what I know is that we tobacco was the thing. What? Um, Tobacco? mm Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, we still have, like, that's still there. But those are the main things. And we provided that for, like, Mama always tells me that we were the bread basket of Africa. That's what she says. And, yeah, like, your tobacco was, like, the main thing, I think. So what would have made you guys rich is if you could actually make cigarettes. Not yeah, they do, could. yeah. Yeah, they do. So that was, yeah, that was you the make- thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it okay. wasn't just, there was the, then factories that made them. and didn't. Yeah, okay. Ugochi, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, I get what you're saying with the farming. And if everyone does the same thing, the price will be low. Mm-hmm. But everyone can, that could be like the base, right? The farming. Yeah, exactly. And then everybody can find their niche. So if everyone is is growing cassava or something like that. Mm-hmm. Hey, someone could be like a cassava. I don't know. I know what you're trying <laughs> to say. From yeah. someone else. Someone else, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it could yeah. grow from there, and you know. Yeah, absolutely. Because also, I feel like if the country can feed itself, yeah. like let's just say we can just feed ourselves, and no one needs to import a lot of things. 
because I've heard this statistic somewhere that is in Nigeria. I think it's Nigeria that they're the biggest imports of tomato puree. Yeah, probably. Yep. But they, had the biggest <laughs> export, but they make the most tomatoes. Uh huh. Yep. That's you right. Need, you don't need to oil. order. You can make it yourself. And so if the country can just like feed itself, like I always say that we don't need the Western world. We don't need them. Like we can do it. We can just look after ourselves. And like a country like Zambia, which is next to Zimbabwe, like they made laws that are really favorable to like big companies, Mm -hmm. like tax laws. So a lot of those con- companies have got going going in their country and the economy is rising. Yeah. And I'm just like, just do that. Like, just do something. <laughs> yeah. Let's go back. Speaking of farming, what was disheartening was when I read in the book, the when the old woman was describing white people as witches and or wizards, sorry, wizards, and how they came in, saw a good piece of land and kind of like marginalized or pushed everybody to the margins and took the best lands for themselves. And basically that's how Jeremiah and Baba Muku ended up where they were because their father was part of the people that were pushed or their grandfather. Mm-hmm. So obviously she was basically describing colonialism and that whole period. Mm-hmm. But I think what was sad was when Tambu went into town and she had an encounter with the white woman Mm. and the white woman was just shouting things like child abuse. In my mind, I'm like, this is how like populations are removed from reality because there's a good story of why the white woman is standing where she is, which is that like her father or her grandfather were part of these wizards in quote that came and just took, not took land, but just pushed everyone to the margins and came to take their land. So of course, people like Tambu and her family are in the rural areas trying to fend for themselves. So it's funny how she's been removed, like the, the white woman is removed from that reality and all she can care about is saying someone is experiencing child abuse without really knowing the whole story mm-hmm. so that like, stood out problem. to me yeah like she's actually the problem but then she's yeah. screaming at man like he does something wrong it's like you're the problem your people are the problem <laughs> i wouldn't say t- uh, yeah, well like yeah i don't know if she's the problem but i just yeah, but her people yeah, are the problem just... because it's like you've country and you've taken from this country have you okay I have a I have a question because Amara introduced me to this debate that happened like maybe in the 60s or something <laughs> I don't know between high school students right? yeah remember no I've only watched like two epi- two of them <laughs> oh my god I watched like five <laughs> so you have a panel of debaters from different parts of Africa like Nigeria Ghana South Africa Kenya and the South African and these are high school students so the, the South African one the one I watched really believes that she, her people are entitled to that land. And she has a different narrative than we all do of, of her people in South Africa and apartheid. Is she white? She's white, yes. Okay. Yeah, her- that's, why, that's why I was hesitating when Rufi said, oh, she's part of the problem. She doesn't believe she's part of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. If, like when somebody believes- like five generations ago did that, yeah. they're now in the land. So, but, so go to, but, sorry, no, carry on. In the book, in the book though, like mm-hmm. she's not, she's not five generations removed. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Like, but obviously, with this, with this a young lady, um, obviously she's obviously been born into this country. She's born in that land, mm-hmm. and that's obviously a very difficult conversation. Mm-hmm. But, but you also have to be responsible. Like, for example, like with slavery, like the white people that are alive now, they have to answer for their ancestors, right? Mm-hmm. Why? They have to because they're the only ones just being devil's advocate oh no 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 i understand but she because they're the only ones that can speak for them right or not even speak for them they don't have to take on the burden but they can help make it right like what well they can help make it like if i met a late i don't know someone like 10 years from now and like i don't know someone what my family hurt them or something and i'd be trying to make it right or just to say sorry or something i would okay ruby can i ask can i say something I don't know where Zimbabwe stood with the whole transatlantic slavery, but I know Igbo people, which is where I come from. We were very much part of slave traders. Like we used to trade slaves. Mm -hmm. I don't know who is who, but you want me to go and apologize to? I'm just being a devil's advocate again. Like, who do I, I I don't, I don't associate myself with like what happened four or five mm-hmm. centuries ago. I'm not saying, I'm not defending everyone. I'm just saying that's why I think this conversation hits a brick wall. Those mm-hmm. people are dead. <laughs> like, what do I, what's my business? What do I have to do with mm-hmm. the situation? 
but the problem is they're dead but the problems are still persisting Mm -hmm. and the problems are continuing Mm -hmm. because if it was just that simple then the new generation of people wouldn't be racist the new generation of people the new Mm -hmm. whites in south africa may be more inclusive of like the blacks in south africa but they're carrying on like no no there's no change is what i'm trying to say so mm-hmm. although they're mm-hmm. far removed and they want the initial problem, they're not making it any better. They haven't cut, have a, had a aha moment and said, wait a minute, this is not quite right. We should be like this or we should do this. We should progress in this way. They're not saying that. They're continuing perpetuating the racism that their ancestors Yeah, have. I see what I see what you mean. Like, you know, the black people, even after slavery in America, have gone mm-hmm. through Jim Crow laws, we read that horrible part in homecoming of um of the coal mine era. I would always talk about it because I just was traumatized by that whole chapter. The coal mine era, Jim, Jim Crow laws, the civil rights movement, down to Dante Wright and George Floyd. So yeah, he got killed the other day. The other yeah, day so, he got killed. And this is America only. I hear like in places like South America, Brazil, even in Africa, there's still a lot of apartheid. It's just that mm-hmm. it's a new, it's taking on a new form. So mm-hmm. yeah, I kind of see like somebody somewhere is perpetrating it. It's few droplets but it's it's not gone it's not oh that happened in the past and this is us now there's still that connection there so it was it, it is a very complex yeah yeah complex I believe that there's other factors because if i can say i'm far removed from my from my own ancestors who who probably sold slaves and yeah not to say not to i don't not to say i don't want to answer you know to their crimes but no i'm not them and I don't know what I can do to remedy the situation now as I am. You know what I mean? So yeah, the other factors that continues to keep the, yes. the hatred, the racism alive. What is that? I don't think that we're exploring that. We're we're focused on our ancestors and the past, past. But there's something going on now in the media, whether it be the media or other things, that continues to breed this hatred for yes. certain. Yes. I think, yeah, yeah, that definitely is. And I think it is beneficial to the powers that be for that hatred to exist and to stay. Yeah, basically politicizing things. This race mm-hmm. report we were talking about, that mm-hmm. definitely adds to it. You know, the political parties in power and, and what they do to like um, stir up people's emotions and just play on that wheel. You know, it could be racism. It could be other forms of discrimination. Just hammer on it. Like what's happening in America, there is definitely like, I believe anyway, some sort of undercover, like, let's call black people in the in the police force thing. Because the way these people are just getting shot, like, they didn't do anything. Like, you're shooting a man that's running away. He's not a threat to you. No one's trying to shoot someone's leg to disarm them. No one's trying to shoot someone's arm to disarm them. And it just seems that there's definitely something that we don't know that's happening because it's just so hurtful. And there's actually no change whatsoever. It's just, it's concealed, like in the words of Kanye West, racism is still alive. They just still, conce- they'd just be concealing it. Because before you could just kill a black person and hang them. But now all you got to do is be a police officer and kill a black man. And then you get off. Like you, it's yeah, it's the getting off. I don't understand. Mm. It's, it's the getting off. I just never understand. The guy that was shot last year that is now, I think, paralyzed. He happened after George Floyd. The police officer apparently is back to work. Mm-hmm. Rihanna Taylor, nobody was ever convicted. Everybody is just back to work. So I, I don't know, like it's, a, it's definitely a very difficult conversation, but I think very it's difficult. important for us to put ourselves in like a normal white person's shoes who's just living their life. And every time on the news, they are hearing that, oh, it's white people against black people. So it's very important to be sensitive about these things. I always say if we were white and they were black, I think it would probably be the same. Look at what's going on in the whole of Africa. Yeah. Like, so... It's very important to be sensitive, but just all as, as Ugochi, like there are other forces out there that we don't yeah. know or understand that is definitely stirring things up. Mm. Yeah. To me, I think at the end of the day, one, one thing people are not saying is just always a game of the rich versus the poor. Any other thing we say is just arbitrary. 
that's it and yeah well, that's- and that's the thing that's that's why they separate you because they killed martin luther king after when he was organizing the poor, poor man's march like he was organizing yeah. for all the working class black and white to march to for change and that is yeah. what they're scared of because if we all unite problem you know yeah. what i mean in problem. every society it's always the rich versus the poor once you're up in a certain class all this race thing this thing mm. like blah blah it doesn't matter you're up there mm. Money can buy anything and let you, let you live a comfortable life. Mm-hmm. What I think race really does, and I have I have my own views, but I'll <laughs> keep it simple. What race really does to us now is it paralyzes us because we're so emotional. So we've we become so emotional because of this that we can't see we can't see past it. People mm-hmm. are always yeah. going to see someone, but when you can when you can recognize when something happens out there. And then the news says, oh, black man, white, white man, you know, Chinese man. You have to see that they are trying to get to your emotions and trying to trigger you, trying to trigger us people again to get us upset. Once you, once you can control a people that way mm-hmm. and we're easily. Controlled. Yeah. If we mm-hmm. can see past race, mm-hmm. we, we can see it for what it is, but not let it affect us the way it does mm-hmm. and become powerful in the world. I'm sure these people will find another group of people. I know what you're saying. Yeah. It's just like not giving someone, like if I'm walking on the street and someone calls me a nigga, I'm not giving them my attention. I'm not exactly. going to mm-hmm. call me a nigga. Like, mm-hmm. But you see, the always, media like, knows like, that, sorry, I was just going to say, the media knows that half, of, like 90% of the person will never work away, walk away, they'll video it, they'll yeah. record it, they'll report it to the news and it's, it makes a major news cycle. Because mm-hmm. it's like you know? what you're saying, that it's, it's emotional. I, I've never mm-hmm. experienced like over racism at all. Like, and it's going to be, it's going to take a work in us. We have to work on that mm-hmm. because actually you're calling yeah. me you're calling me a slave you're calling me this that's what you, that's what you're doing and okay <laughs> that was deep right so i always defend namu i think what they had as children was just more of a mix of these are the roles expected we've always grown up knowing this and more of like sibling banter obviously and then remember it was told through na- um, tambu's tambu's narrative so she was never going to be fair about how things happened Mm-hmm. what do you guys think i know you say that but i don't like that kid i don't like him I, either. i don't i, I don't, don't like it. that kid whatsoever mm. i don't like that kid and because i get the sibling thing we had that and my like growing up like so my, when, my, when my mom moved here like i was we we were at my grandma's house and it was me and all our cousins and we had that like brotherly sisterly like fights or whatever but we loved each other still do you know what I mean? Like we, we used to play these games, not the stupid games like African games. We used to play these, um, like just to, like whatever. We had those things. Like we had similar fights, whatever. But there was love. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like he wanted to make his sister's life hell. Like that, I cannot forgive him yet. I don't care what his point of view what is. Did he do? For what did he do? Really? his sister's maze and giving to other women when she's working so hard to go to school. I would never forgive him for that. I That's cannot. The other one is when he came, when he came back from school, I think, and then the sisters had to go get his bag. Mm. I forgot. I think that one of the sisters had a baby on her back, getting the bag, mm-hmm. and he didn't care. He, first of all, I'm not saying that's a man's job, but your bags are probably heavy, right? You can't bring any of them in. Come on, just do something. something. And I think, like, yeah, and the reason I can't forgive it is obviously I'm Zimbabwean, and our parents raised us to love each other. And like, for example, like my cousins, we're not even allowed to call each other cousins, we call each other brother and sisters. My, my parents always instilled that in us. So I'm like... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I get all your sentiments. And I think growing up as, yeah, I had like a moment where I thought, I think my brother is just favoured because I don't know whether it's because he's the first child or because he's the only boy. But mm. things used to irritate me, like, even for, like, we are only a year apart, but even things like, you know, snacks, he got, like, 10 naira, I got 5 naira. I didn't see why, like, the size of our stomachs are the same thing. I always used to wonder, like, why did he get significantly more than I did when, when we were almost the same age? But we've grown up now, and we've just kind of matured, but I think it's a more, like, a sibling rivalry thing, and I just yeah. thought that's where Namo and Tambu were. And then he, his demise was really, really kind of depressing. Like, he just died of mumps. And that was the end of... Even Tambu never even spoke about him again. Like, she no. wasn't even spoke going into the house where he was. Yeah. I was, that, yeah, she didn't even... I think that's what... I think when you finish reading the book, that's why, like, that line, how the book starts, that when my brother passed away, I wasn't sad. 
she wasn't yeah I like the bravery in that and the honesty in that because I think when people die they get gl- glorified don't they like they were perfect because you yeah, know yeah, yeah. Bad life. but she's like yeah nah I'm sad for my mum I, I she was had, shocked. She had for my mum but she was not sad for herself <laughs> And I think the, the most interesting thing was by the end of the book, her experiences mirrored her brother. Like they just didn't want to be associated with the homestead. Yeah. They had just seen things. They were more exposed. Everything mm-hmm. about the homestead, like make them ashamed. So I thought we were leaning towards, you know what? My brother was an asshole, but I understand where he was coming from now. She just never, ever referred to him after, oh yeah, he died of mumps. And yeah. I've moved to his spot. <laughs> that was cold. That was cold. Yeah. Hell of cold. But she was, she was over it. Like she was over it. She was that very much. She was marginalized. She didn't get what she needed, what she thought she deserved, and she yeah, didn't. And yeah. he was a blessing for her. It was because <laughs> oh. she's the one that she she's the one that then had to go to school. And from what I know of her, I think she's mm-hmm. now she has a three degrees. And she, you know, she followed through. She didn't oh, is this an autobiography? Is this a real life story? Yeah, it's real life. I'm pretty sure really? it is. Oh, yeah, I yeah. I think this... I, I kind of got that feeling it was. It's almost like a memoir, isn't it? That makes sense. Yeah. Because I always just... I think one thing that I felt at the book was that I just... We were just in her thoughts quite a lot. And I yeah. was just like, where is the action? I don't want to be in your head all the time. <laughs> When she was in the car going to her uncle's house and then when she was returning to the homestead, I'm like, ah, this is like three pages of us mm-hmm. knowing your thoughts. We are not interested in that. But if it's a memoir, then completely yeah, understand that. Right. We can explore that, yeah, maybe. It's semi, semi-autobiographical autobiographical novel. Ah, like okay. Did you read the book too? I know there's a book too. No, yeah. I want to read the next book. Yeah. I want to see where it takes yeah okay so second to the last conversation is about the women this book oh, was just yeah. filled with characters yeah of women the women so, were so Rufi, who stood out for you and why obviously nyasha her Nyasha. Um, husband, yeah because she just i felt like i was reading about myself just mm, understandably yeah yeah, she because she moves she moves to England and then goes back. Well, I haven't officially gone back to Zimbabwe because I just go to visit. I try to go every year because it's just the best. But yeah, and just some of the things she's went through, I went through, and just like her, the audacity of her that with like I said that in a positive way, the audacity of her like to stand up for herself, to believe, and not even to believe to know that her opinion matters. And to fight for opinion. Because I, I went through that as well as a child. I had so much I had so, so much to say. And I'm sure this is the same in all African cultures, but you're not meant to have an opinion. You yeah, know, yeah. if your parent says something, that's it. End of story. The conversation is done. And I was never satisfied with that. I was like, you will listen to what I have to say. I am happy to follow the discipline, whatever it is, from my parents. Like if they say don't do this again. I won't do it again. But can I just tell you what happened? I want you to understand why I did something. Because you can feel very like villainized and very like you're just naughty. Like you just did that because you're naughty and you're being disobedient. But it's like I wanted to explain so they would understand and give me more grace if they understood where I was coming from. Funny enough saying that, it just makes me realize why I'm a very understanding person. I always need to know the why. I don't like judging yeah. people. And like, like, I always say, I can even understand a murderer. Like, if someone said to me, oh, I killed someone. And I'm like, okay. And then they're like, oh, but they raped my mom. I'm not going to look at you as a cold-blooded killer. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, al- I was always trying to get my point across. And she's the same. You know what I mean? She challenged her father. I challenged my father. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I did it. My father was abusive to my mom and to my brothers and not to me. And mm-hmm. I, ch- I, I would challenge my dad. And he struggled with that. And funny enough, the word challenge was the trigger for him, just like it was. Yeah. It. Exactly. It's like, he'd be like, you're challenging me. You're challenging your father. You're challenging me. It was this thing <laughs> like you can't <laughs> challenge him. And it triggered him to the point where he became violent. And it's actually interesting. Like we, we were talking about therapy before, like and me having the conversations with my dad, I understand him more. So when he was young, like, he didn't know his dad. And so um, anything he did wrong people would be like oh you're a bastard son Mm -hmm. and he was challenged a lot or made feel a lot away when he was younger because he's a strong man he's like six foot he's like six foot four or something he's really tall Mm -hmm. 
like a strong black man. So anyone that basically he felt disrespected by, he just hit them. Mm-hmm. That was the coping. So he gained respect and fear that way. So that triggered onto how he was raising his kids. His cha- the challenging thing was like, you're challenging me. And then he would get violent. But I still was not afraid and still would challenge him and tell him he was wrong. So I relate to yeah. her so much and I admire her, her courage. And she's so mature for a young woman. Just she how she, like when her mum leaves the father for like the week she left, she was understanding. She's like, sometimes you have to do that. Yeah. She she was able to discern between her mother's love for her and her mother's need to grow as a woman. And I thought, amazing. Yeah, at that age, I don't even think I'll understand that. And yeah, you're right. She was quite mature for her age. Okay, so we've heard from you and Yasha. It's quite a good um, analysis. Yeah, How about you, Ugochi? So my favorite character is Lucia. Oh, yes, yeah. Lucia. Yeah. We, we, yeah. I want to really go in deep about her. So go, because okay. she's fierce. She's very fierce. So my favorite part in the book was when all the Baba McCrew and all the siblings were having that meeting about their cousin and obviously their cousin and Jeremiah, which is Tembu's dad, are messing up, right? They're both sleeping with the same woman. <laughs> but Baba Mukuru and the rest of them don't say anything about that. They don't say like, hey, you've messed up. You're the your reason. Instead, they're blaming yeah, mm-hmm. the women, right? And Lucia is like, oh, okay, so all of you guys are going to be quiet here. I'm going to go say something. And she did. And she went in there and she got the mm-hmm. cousin by the ears, I think. <laughs> she did drag him by the ear. Do you know how embarrassing that is? That's a like, very classic discipline move in Zimbabwe. My mom, Nigeria as well. Yeah, my yeah. mom. Yeah. yeah, and then there was this hot splash. You know, horrible. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. And she did. It that. was a powerful moment because she walked in on him lying about her. Yes. So at that point, as he's lying, what is he going to do? Because the person he's lying against is right there, and she knows the truth. So like a deer in headlights. Mm-hmm. I think there was a quiet admiration that Baba Makuru had of her because he gave her a job at the end. It took mm-hmm. about two, three days to yeah. arrange things. He just didn't want her trouble. I don't know what he was, but I found it. He didn't resist. He just said, yep, this is a good solution. Mm-hmm. Let me mm-hmm. get you a job. So I think there was that quiet, mm-hmm. like, do you know what? You're I the think, only person yeah. in this family. Yeah, he admired people that wanted to do something for themselves. Yeah. Mm, yeah he liked that and i think because it took the burden off him yeah mm-hmm. yes true. yes that's very true i didn't think about it the one mm. person that i think stood out for me as a woman is the mom sorry i don't know her name tambo's mom so I, I don't she was my nini but like, yeah that just means yeah it's fine i can call her my nini like i just feel she's not that sort of woman that you kind of overlook because you'd be like, you know, she's right into the system. She's just playing her role. But she had a lot to deal with. Her two kids died. Um, so the one she had when she got impregnated by Jeremiah at yeah. first. Mm-hmm. And then Namo died. And then she was basically losing her, like the emotional tra- trauma where my second child is put in the exact situation of the first child that died no yeah. one is explaining anything to me yeah. and everyone is just letting her walk through and then you watch your daughter also change towards you no one is asking for you for your opinions it's just yeah she's just that woman like the village woman that we are going to be embarrassed about think- yeah she had a lot of strength and it's just a, a bit sad that you know that her situation would not improve in any way and I, I like the fact that she was fighting back a bit, obviously being rude to Meguru. Is it Meguru? Yeah. Um, you know, trying to let her voice be heard, also like talking to her daughter and stuff. I mean, she wasn't heard, but it's just it's just a very dark and sad situation. But I thought I should mention her because she's just one of yeah, these characters. Yeah, it was that very, you know. She went through a lot. She went through a lot. a lot. This husband of hers was just useless. Yeah, I just I like how we, you saw people that were given the opportunity to be helped and they took it. And then you saw people that were given the opportunity to help. They were just waiting for some. Do you know what I find interesting, actually? Sorry, something just came to my head. But right. do you remember when Baba Mkuru comes back from England? Uh-huh. And then he says to Jeremiah, his brother, 
like mm-hmm. oh you, you know i'm glad that you did the right thing that the money we sent you used for school fees yeah and he didn't did he he did not because he did not use it for school fees no. because otherwise she would have been going to school and we never addressed that like yeah he was obviously bad with money because when his daughter you know made her 10 pounds to go out to school he tried to go and get that money yeah and, you know, he got his wife at a young age and I feel like she was trapped with this man, but I don't think she even really respected him. He was just happy to be carried. Yeah, and I wonder about that. So there are two things. So I was going to say, like, I don't understand the situation where everybody ignores the fact that he slept with two sisters. Like, so when I come to have sex with my husband after he's just impregnated my sister, how does it work in the bedroom? That's number one. And then number two, I just wonder with um, his relationship with Baba Makuru, where if there was this Mukuru, sorry, if there was this hidden thing where Baba Mukuru was probably feeling guilty that he was the one they sent off to the missionary school mm. while the other children sat back and mm. he knew from that day, like his whole life is going to try and make up for that. Mm. And yeah. if the brother was just happy to ride on that, yeah, I think Baba Mukuru is trapped in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why he feels this, you know, he he helped his family to detriment of his family. Mm-hmm. Like, yes. Uh, you know, and because I think he felt that like survival remorse, like I survived, I got the opportunity, yes. they didn't. You know, he felt guilty. But then some people don't want to be helped. They're, they're not taking the help, you know. Because yeah. I want to, at the wedding, didn't he say he was going to give his young brother his house? Yes. So, if this and this sequel, I want to see what happens with that. Yeah, if he'll stop giving money after that, like, hey, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have your own house like that, you're gonna have to figure it out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So the last point, the need for control, but we kind of addressed it in the beginning with COVID mm-hmm. and everything, and everybody feeling helpless, and that's where your habits kind of exacerbate because you're like, this one I can control, like. Mm-hmm. This is what makes me happy. This is why I'm going to be con- so. If it could be through alcohol consumption, it could be through drug overdose, um, not eating like um, Nikki. And then in this book, I found it interesting that by the time Yasha started signs of bulimia, like you could almost understand she was trapped. Like trapped. that kind of this is my family. I can't mm-hmm. move. I am the daughter, but I don't have anything in common with these people what they are saying to me is chinese i am in prison mm-hmm. so by the time you got there mm-hmm, you know from from her experience i kind of understand what people going through these kind of decisions go through and just the need to control something whether mm-hmm. it's harmful to them or I, I i just it really puts it in a lot of perspective for me the need to control but it's also the need to i think be heard yeah be heard in that way because yeah, she wasn't being listened yeah. to yeah i mean one of the things that i loved i love the fact that she punched her dad back like the way he he was hitting her from the description it's like he was really like hitting his daughter and like i imagine him to be a large man i like in my head mm-hmm. he's that tall yeah. and like and the fact that she punched him back i just i was like that's something that i would do and i was just like I'm going to hit you back. And I love the fact she stood up. She just stood up for herself. But she was trapped and her mind it was gonna go a bit crazy. And like you're saying, she had to find something controlling. What I found really, really interesting is her relationship with Tambo. And it's Tambo's observation of her when she comes and her dress is too short. And she thinks, mm-hmm. oh, she's yes. so brilliant. And it is the classic thing that happens to you. Yes, when, when you go back home. When you go back home. Because I have a relationship with my mom, and I'm like, mom, I don't want to do that. I can say all these things. People are like, oh, my God, she said something back to her mother. How dare she? And it's like, yeah, we're good. Like, we're good at it. <laughs> oh, we work. Keep going. But, yeah, I found that so interesting because she admired her cousin so much. And it's very interesting mm-hmm. towards the end of the book, she's starting to get the courage. She starts reflecting on how she's actually been marginalized and she's accepted it. And that her obedience is actually her being silent and her allowing to be, yeah, her herself allowing herself to be silent and not to have a voice. She started mm-hmm. to learn that. And it's what it takes. It takes something in her that sits 
does not sit with her spirit. Her parents get married mm -hmm. does not sit well with her spirit. Yeah, yeah. It, it completely discombobulates everything inside her because yeah. it's attacking who she is and her family because she feels like yeah. we're really saying we're less than we've been a good family yeah but we mm -hmm. have to get married to become official i'm not okay with this parade mm. and knowing what her mother has gone through and how it's time to get a voice that those feelings were so strong that it birthed her voice mm -hmm. and yeah said, i'm not going to this wedding mm -hmm. i'm not i'm not going to this wedding and i just found that so powerful because i think sometimes Whoever we are inside will eventually come out. Yeah. You now have to speak for yourself. Yeah. She was no longer just going to be grateful and not do anything. That was a proud moment for me, for mm -hmm. her. Right. Does anyone have any last words? What you liked most about the book? What stood out for you? Or should we move on? Well, I want to say this. Nyasha, obviously, they go to a disco in the book and then she has the encounter with the boy and they're like dancing or teaching each other some new dances yeah. and, uh -huh. you know this this is what leads to her father hitting them because her father calls her a whore which is absolutely yeah. unacceptable and horrifying that he called his yeah. daughter a whore. but what I find interesting and I think it's, it's similar to other African cultures is that you grow up and you basically get told don't talk to boys you're encouraged never ever ever to talk to boys right not to have that interest in them you know and then you grow up, you go to university maybe, and then suddenly, every time you see a family, where's the husband? Where's the husband? Where's your husband? So I'm like, <laughs> like when is he coming? And it's like, you've told me all my life not to associate myself with these people. With boys, yeah. sex. Now I'm supposed to have a husband. And it's so yeah. it's right because we're not prepared for it, right? And I feel like all these conversations, the whole point of being a parent is to pass on knowledge. So it's like you should be telling your daughters and your, your sons, this is how you get a woman. This is how you approach a woman. This is how you, what you see in a man. This is how, like, there should be a lesson. About sex. But you're not talking about sex. about sex. You're not Even talking about nothing. menstruation. Yeah. Exactly. And then all of a sudden, you're supposed to find a man. Now it's like, you should do your hair. But the way Nyasha was looking after her body in terms of like, she wants to look cute. She, she's, a, she's a fashionista. She wants, she knows what yeah. she has to do. All those things are negative. But now you're older, it's going to be like, oh, do your hair nice so you can get a man. It's just so backwards because you discouraged that. Yeah. And some woman would have buried that inside them. Yeah. And then now you want it to be rebirthed. Yeah. And it's like, it's so unfair and it's so backwards. And I just want that stuff to, to be deaded in like, my culture. I don't want that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I voice that. And I, I think it's crazy because luckily it's not just the African culture, like Bridgerton. Did you guys watch Bridgerton? No. no. <laughs> I've been told to watch it. <laughs> How yeah. have you not watched Bridgerton? Yeah, oh my I god! Need info. I need something to what? watch. Anyway, so one of the big themes in in Bridgerton was the relationship between the main character and her mom, mm -hmm. and you know the fact that, as you said, Rufi, there was always this rush, like from the beginning to the end, all the mothers were hustling to marry their daughters to like the dukes of the town, and it was all about what you wearing, what let let's like tighten your corset. What, what are you doing? You must act like a lady. And then the main character was like, okay, now I've entered. And she didn't know how to have sex. She didn't know what, how to get pregnant. And then she she was like, she had to, I think she ended up having to ask her servant, like, what's going on here? Or something like, what do I do? She asked her servant a funny question. I don't remember what it was. But everybody was just stunned, like, okay. And then she had to confront her mom. She was like, what's going on here? You didn't tell me all this. You just sent me off, had a party that I got married to a duke. No one really explained anything to me. And yeah, she went on and on talking about it. And I was like, wow, this is quite profound because we always say African culture, but this, this is everywhere. <laughs> like there's just mm -hmm. that, that gaping hole mm -hmm. of like things not being explained, especially female issues. When did that show take place? What era? 18th century though, in the sorry 17th century so maybe it's because African culture is kind of still old it is yeah so, yeah maybe yeah you don't, your parents don't talk to you about anything so then like they also have an expectancy to now you share with them it's like we didn't listen the way you started this year we didn't sh we didn't share so mm -hmm. now you want me to start talking 
I, I have nothing to say to you. <laughs> you know, I'm no, not but comfortable. I I know that, but at the same time, can you imagine your parents being because I because I always say that, oh my god, with my daughter, I'm just gonna like even be in the same room with her her first time having sex because she just needs to know stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, like yeah. it's a it's an embarrassing conversation to have it's as a teenager. It has, it has to be hard though. It has to be hard. Because I want to know, I yeah, wanna, yeah. obviously, like, I want to try to teach my daughter to, like, I'm no mm-hmm. crazy Christian and obviously don't want her to have sex until she gets married. But teach her to love her body, to know that she deserves pleasure and how to, because there's a lot of things that I find, like, sexually, just even having my voice in bed. Like, do you know what I mean, mm-hmm. having a voice in, 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 in the bedroom with, like, your partner. Like, being able to say what you want. It's all so foreign. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Yeah. Also, we're also taught to please the man, so you kind of just do what the guy wants. But, like, mm-hmm. I think from my experience with women and all my really close girlfriends, like, it takes time for the girl to actually be like, actually, I like this. I like that. Mm-hmm. It takes us a minute. And I'm not saying you should talk to your daughter about those in depth things, because that's also part of how great she can discover that. But she should definitely have a foundation from you of what to expect, how to say no, like the confidence mm-hmm. to say no. That like my one of my friends, one of my best friends, Rachel, she always says these things I love to guys. She says to them, even if I'm naked, if I then say no, it's a no. Yeah, it's a no. It don't matter. I've had situations where I feel like I've wanted to change my mind, but I'm like, oh, I've gone too far. I can't change my mind. You know what I mean? So yes, like, no, it's not just you, it's everyone. Yeah. If you want to love my daughter, no matter what point you can say no. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I, I agree with that. Yeah. We'll strive to do better than our parents. It's just funny, like we say all these awesome things. And I have like friends who have kids now. And you know, the mm-hmm. dynamics, like the relationship I have with my parents was so much different from our generation. So mm-hmm. I think in the sense we are trying, it's just be interesting to see mm-hmm. what our, our our children complain about. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of love in um, African mm-hmm. family, like a lot of love, there but they're, it's not expressed with words. Okay, so I'm very excited about these next two parts. We're almost ending. Rufi, yes. tell us something we need to know about Zimbabwe, like in terms of a myth that is not necessarily true or something, a fact that people don't really talk about that we non-Zimbabweans should know or something you've heard about Nigeria that resonates with Zimbabweans or doesn't well Do if, I think of, if I think of my people my Zimbabwe people I love yeah. my country love, yeah. love my country like when I go home and I land I am emotional I'm happy when I smell the soil like it's, it's everything sorry let me ask how long have you spent in Zimbabwe at any point in time like what's the longest time you've spent so like obviously my life from when I was born to nine but um, no, no, apart me, from that now like three weeks at a time I so, beg you that you're not you're not suffering <laughs> <laughs> my sister let me break it to you it's always different well, when you, you go on holiday Oh, it's always different. Oh, yeah, I know that. I know that because I see... I see okay, my that's no. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's but no that. I love, Sorry, carry but, on. I cut you off. No, it's okay. No, that's the whole idea, you know, back and forth. My... The thing I love about, about Zimbabweans, they are such... Everyone's an entrepreneur. Like, they are ah, okay. such hustlers. Like, everyone... Okay. Like, in everything we've been through, they're so resilient. Like, they're a very resilient country, very resilient people, and everyone's trying to make money, and everyone's always figuring something out. And I love that, love about, love that about them. And nothing really gets them down. You know, it, like you're saying, it's hard. And I see my family going through it. And it's, like, I try to bring some joy when I go home and try and do things for them yeah. that they can experience, like, not so, some hardships. Because there's always a time of the day where the electricity has gone out mm-hmm. or whatever. But they're just really resilient people. And they're really good. They're really business-minded people. You know, I pray for my country and I pray for the opportunities to come because I think it will flourish so much. Hopefully things change. Yeah. And the thing that I feel really strongly about, and it's not a positive thing, and I hope no one like kills me for saying it, but I think we are a very, very passive nation. And that okay. frustrates me because I feel like with everything we've been through, like with Mugabe and stuff, I just feel like in another country, they would have been like an opposing there would have been civil unrest, like people that would have fought hard to overthrow the government. And I just feel like we just let things happen to us. And if things mm. are changing now and the young generation have more to, to say, but I don't, I wish my people were more, 
aggressive about their freedom and about but it's going to cost lives of course and people don't want to do that but I think we're a very passive nation and I wish we weren't yeah yeah it's, it's interesting I love this part of our podcast because we hear about so many other countries and what they think about themselves like last time it was Kenya and they said something interesting which is that the guy said he, they were more like silent sufferers so it's interesting that you're now saying that your passive people and we were going back and forth and obviously Nigerians are a bit aggressive but is there any yeah. other is there any other like fun fact or any other thing be Nigerians as you know we but, criticize ourselves a lot so this is a safe fact. space <laughs> Zimbabweans are drinkers like they drink okay. like they're like heavyweight drinkers like men will drink from like the morning to like night and you won't really know that they've drank. They just can handle their liquor. Like, they drink a lot. And I actually think we have a nation of functioning alcoholics. And I think it's because we don't have therapy. <laughs> like, there's some really fun, interesting facts about, like, mental health. In Zimbabwe. There's, like, not enough, like, therapists. It's, like, one therapist for, like, 100,000 people or something like that. A lot of people are, like, undiagnosed with things. And I think, like, but we're drinkers and we have a good time. We know how to have a good time. No matter what is going on, no matter how bad things are, we know how to have a good time. We have fun. Like that is something you will never miss in Zimbabwe. Like you will, people know how to party. People know how to get together and be with each other. Yeah. Would you ever go back to live in Zimbabwe? Like good. I would love to. Yeah, I would love to go back and live in Zimbabwe and give back to my community. To my That's not the question. Would you ever go back? I want to. I love to. I would love to go back. To no, I want. To, I want to go back. I want to go back. To be honest, there are things that hold me back, and yeah, I've been spoiled like living in a of course, in a of country. course. You know, just things like the bank, like they can just take your money. I just can't deal with that. Yeah. Like I always okay. think about practically how to do it. I probably need to have like international accounts, and or you go back like as an expatriate, like a yeah. lot of money. Because that's what we always yeah. say. Like you can yeah, go back to Nigeria. Have but money. Yeah, I need to have like, I need to be set financially. In yeah. every currency possible. Then you can go every back. Time, like, and like, like, like a king. Exactly. And then I can help so, people out. So, our turn. So, um, I don't have Zimbabwean friends. I don't think I've. Okay. So, I don't have a lot of Zimbabwean friends. So, I don't really know that much about Zimbabweans. But mm. apart from Nigeria, I think you're the next African country that I've seen that is a bit out and about and like you know just everywhere in the UK yeah, I know yeah. my sisters went to yeah. school with a lot of Zimbabweans and they were the people that they had to bond with because there were not a lot of Nigerians but yeah. there were like Zimbabweans around and you will find, you find out that they were we were all quite similar like in terms of the energy we bring yes. Yes. and then another thing about Zimbabwe I know is uh, Makosi you can't I, again I love Big Brother do you, do you know Makosi? I remember Makosi. Of course, of course, Big Brother. Hi. Yeah. Hey. So, uh, uh, if I think you're ever me. listening, I was such a fan. Um, so that's another thing about. Uh, oh yes, yeah, she was an old woman. She was an old woman. I like. Yeah, her. yeah. I follow her on Instagram now. She's karma, but yeah, she's gone through a lot of stuff. Like she had a cancer scare, so uh-huh. she's a bit more, you know, level-headed, but still the same energy. Yeah, so that's the and then. She's so beautiful. Yeah, she is. And then the third thing is just Mugabe. Like, um, obviously, coming into this country was the peak mm-hmm. of when, like, the UK absolutely hated Mugabe. And there was a lot of, like, trading bans. So there was, I, I just got this sense that, you know, they were, like, a poor African country that mm-hmm. was under this dictator. And their inflation rates were ridiculous. Like, it was, I think it was, like, 100,000%. Mm-hmm. but the way mm-hmm. you're describing it now like Mugabe had good times it's just you yeah, know think, yeah. like an African dictator yeah like the saying goes like absolute power corrupts corrupt, absolutely and that's why people need to have served terms and leave and I think that he served for so long that he lost his way yeah. Um, but yeah. I'm grateful for him because he did do a lot of good for our country good to hear because we never yeah. hear that in the news because exactly. I follow the mainstream media and they hate mm-hmm. Mugabe and I'm just mm-hmm. like it's not possible like he has fa- he has a lot of followers it's just that I don't mm-hmm. know the story enough to make it a, a, a judgment so mm-hmm. Ugochi how about you what have you heard about Zimbabwe like ever not much just Mugabe that's it but bad things about Mugabe so 
like the other day I had to go in and research because now I'm seeing that people like to villainize certain people to like a, yeah. a bad degree where exactly. it's like tell the whole story yeah tell the whole story tell so the whole story the beginning I, I no longer go on like BBC or Wikipedia or things like that to get stories because now I understand you know what they do mm -hmm. yeah so I learned a little bit more about him this past week mm -hmm. he's good he did he started off good yeah, he did yeah and and then um yeah kind of tapered off <laughs> but he did do a lot of good mm -hmm. he did he did a lot okay of so, Rufi, your turn. What have you heard about Nigeria that we should address? So, I have Nigerian friends. Uh, so, I'm better than you. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I, my first boyfriend was Nigerian. Oh, how was uh, that? God, was he a Yoruba demon? Oh, my God. Sorry about that. <laughs> he, he, he was born in England. So, like, he was very British, if that makes sense. Doesn't matter. But, um, but yeah, so I have a lot of Nigerian friends and I made a lot of Nigerian friends at uni as well. So okay. obviously very passionate about their country. I love that. Mm -hmm. Very passionate about their country. Um, I love Jello Fries. Um, but I do think an angel of fries is better. Whatever. Here. Do you guys have Jello Fries in Zimbabwe? We don't. Um, I'm going I, to forget you said that any other Jello Fries is better. I'm just going to forget. Like you were bold enough to say it on this podcast. I'm just Actually, out. one of my one of my exes was from Sierra Leone, and his mom okay. the price is the best love I've ever had in my life. Ignore you. I Ignore. We're gonna cut this part out. I, <laughs> Ignore. I like. Yeah, I need to be connected with him and get the recipe. Yeah, like all good things. Like men, the men get a bad rep. Mm -hmm. Like women get a bad rep. Like the yeah. Yoruba demon, demon thing. I only learned about the Yoruba demon thing like two years ago. I know the main tribes are like Yoruba and Ibu. Is Ibu? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and Hausa. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know like education is very important in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. I know like they're, they're very proud people. Yes. Very proud people, very proud of their children. Like their children are like their trophies. You know what I mean? They like I really, agree. Really, really lift them up. Yeah, I love, and I love Nigeria. I love Nigerian music, obviously. Like Whiskey is like my favorite Afrobeat artist ever. <laughs> Obsessed yeah. with him. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything like different that we do that Zimbabweans don't do? I mean, apart from yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's quite similar, isn't it? Yeah. Like apart apart from Nigerian people, is Zimbabweans that I know are very outspoken and out there in the yeah. UK. We're so out there, yeah, we're 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 everywhere. We're ever like I grew up in South London, which is in Essex, and there's yeah. a strong Zimbabwe community there. There's like a lot of people. There's a proper big community of us. Um, and there's a lot, there's lots of mobbers in Luton. Yeah, we're everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so we are quite similar. Yeah. All right. So the last, so the last segment is about Rufi. It's all about you. Tell us about what you want, like our audience to know, um, our growing audience to know. Thank you for listening to this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I've had such a good time and um, really enjoyed reading the book. And I'll obviously become a regular listener. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to come back. If you guys want me back, I'd love to come back. Um, ah. But yeah, so I'm I'm very passionate about mental health um, mm -hmm. because it's um, something that I've been affected with. And I always feel like it was my intention to be affected with it because I was one of those people that grew up like strong-minded, like you can't be sad, just make yourself happy sort of thing. And I honestly feel good was like, I'm going to show you what it's really like so you can really try and explain it because I'm very good at speaking and stuff like that. So I'm very passionate about that and I'm passionate about sharing the struggles of mental health because I feel that a lot of people don't share the struggle. Like you you hear mm -hmm. after the fact, I was depressed, but I did the work. But I like to share the journey because I think it's important for someone Thank you for that, by the way. to see that thing. So I have a website called Rhythm of Life okay um i have not updated it in like a year i need to really work on it okay. but um it if we post it in our um description center yeah so um it's www.rhythmoflife.com rhythm of life spelled with an e with a three not an e because i couldn't find the domain like <laughs> but yeah so it's just me kind of showing my journey my mental health journey and kind of sharing the bits that i've learned that can help other people um and obviously i'm a writer um, and I want to be a documentary filmmaker. I'm going to start work on my documentary this summer, doing documentary on absentee fathers, telling that story. Very interesting. Uh huh. Um, so I'm going to start research this summer, and hopefully in a couple of years I'll be done. 
and someone will pick it up and I can share it with the world and tell the story and kind of offer some healing for people. All right, thank you. You you were so good in just cooperating right from the beginning. You bought the book before I could even say Jack Robinson. So that was really great. So thank you guys for listening to Afro-Reads Podcast, another episode. Please follow us on all our social media handles at Afro-Reads Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we'll see you on the next show. We will announce the, the next book in our social media handles as well. Take care and have a good week. Bye. All right.